Folks, listen up. I want to take a brief moment and thank our podcast show sponsors, Lombardi Chiropractic, Native Path Supplements, and Redmond Life. Lombardi Chiropractic has been my personal chiropractor for 10 years and has kept my body strong and healthy. Native Path Supplements are used by numerous co-movement clients and our coaching team here at the facility. I highly recommend that you try their chocolate collagen peptides. I was made aware of Redmond Life by one of our trainers here at the facility. He recommended I try Relight Electrolyte Powder. This supplement has dramatically improved my afternoon energy levels and overall hydration. I'd like to thank these three companies for providing outstanding service and products that make our society healthier and more resilient. Mention the Cold Movement Gym podcast when you call Lombardi Chiropractic, and not only will they treat you like family, they will provide a nice, enticing discount to all listeners. And use code COMO15, that's C O M O 15, at checkout when shopping at nativepath.com or redmond.life and receive 15% off all your orders. Your support to our show sponsors assists in us paying for expenses and continuing to provide content we hope you all enjoy. The following is a conversation with Texas Dad, Texas Boys, a very popular YouTube channel and farm products company. After graduating from college and spending 11 years in the financial sector, his family uprooted from the Northeast and left everything they knew about life behind them. They felt their move was necessary in order to provide a better quality of life for their children. They desired to teach them about the real things in life, food, family, farming, and faith. And they are doing this in the great state of Texas. Texas Boys has over 81,000 YouTube subscribers, 7.6 7.6 million video views, and they sell a host of products online, ranging from coffee, honey, apparel, soap, and more. I found Texas Boys through another popular YouTube channel I follow, Off Grid with Doug and Stacy. While some of their viewpoints you may not agree with, I resonate with freedom, sustainable agricultural practices, healthy eating, family values, hard work, and the homestead lifestyle. You are listening to the Co-Movement Gym Podcast, where we inspire people to move and live courageously. If you are enjoying this content, please support our sponsors in the description. I thank each and every one of you for being on this journey with us. Now, please enjoy the show. How are you doing, guys? We're doing good. We're doing good. Awesome. Welcome to the Co-Movement Gym Podcast. I was super thrilled to hear back from you guys that you wanted to hop on a call. I've been following your channel for quite some time. Uh, I resonate with a lot of what you're doing. So we're going to get into some cool stuff today. Great. Let's go for it. So I want to first start off with the idea. I want you to give the listeners a background of your company, Texas Boys, and how it got started. All righty. Well, I started off about, what has it been, six years now. And we, us three brothers, we started out with saving up a little bit of money, $20, and just mowing lawns and stuff like that. And we went out and we bought the cheapest camera on Amazon. And we got it home and we started filming little videos here and there. And mainly we were just filming it for the fun of it. And the little camera came with a waterproof case. So we wanted to go swimming around and stuff with it and filming underwater. But nothing really business-wise. We weren't, we didn't start the channel off to make money or to run a business or anything like that. And then over the years, I just kept steady with it and kept at it and kept on filming and kept on progressing and buying better gear every year and getting better equipment and better editing equipment. And then finally, once I started making a good amount of money, just a little bit anyway, I was like, well, I think we can really pursue this as a business, a real business. And I always with entrepreneurial I was always very entrepreneurial, so I didn't want it to just be our YouTube channel. I think that's where a lot of people go wrong is just having a YouTube channel and just relying on that revenue stream. I always believed in having several of diversifying your income. So, you know, starting a web business and then on top of that, since we have our homestead, we have several different revenue streams coming in through that. 
also. So yeah, that's pretty much where we've been, where we got started. And then lately, the last uh, 30 days, our channel's really blown up and it's been a real big blessing. And we <laughs> grabbed about 50,000 new subscribers or so. Wow. And yeah, it's just been absolutely incredible. It's so weird because now thinking back, if I could have told my 10 year old self, look, buddy, if you do this for six years and you post 1400 videos at that, as soon as you hit six, that six year mark, your channel is going to blow up. You're going to actually get halfway decent views mm -hmm. and people are going to watch you. So and I wrote down a couple of years back, I just remembered it last night. And I wrote down that I wanted to have um, one day to have millions of people actually watch my content. Mm -hmm. And now I have millions of views now from my life's time of work and everything like that. So just so funny how things like that come true. Well, and you do, Matt, I, I looked at your, your channel views. I think it's like 7.6 million views yeah. for all of your videos. I said that yeah. in the introduction there, which is like super impressive. Yeah. How old are you, Matt? I'm only 17. 17. So, so for people yeah. listening, entrepreneurial, you know, ideas and just some inspiration, you're walking this walk with a technology oh, yeah. base following, but you're also, and this is, I don't know, I love this about your videos. You know, you're, you're cowboys, you're homesteaders, yeah. your hands are in the dirt. And I really exactly. I do want to dive into this later in this interview, but like, when did the light bulb go off that your videos could actually turn into a monetized company because there's a difference there. There's a lot of people on YouTube and there's a lot of people yeah. Very few are making money, not just off that platform, but like in general, even like they say they're a homesteader, they say they have a business, but they really don't make money. When did you, when did that light bulb go off that you could make money doing this? Partially what happened is it, it wasn't making money. Yes, exactly. So yeah. And we knew that Matt and the boys wanted to pursue this. We are, we're a very tight knit family very. and we, we, we as parents wanted to procure more land so that our children's inheritance, we could give it to them in our lifetime so we could enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And then this way, it kind of releases them mm -hmm. from this modern debt-based model and concept. They have something to start out with. They have dirt. And then if we could also develop them, because we homeschool, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. if we could develop income streams for them this way, they could be autonomous kind of self-sufficient be able to build their own homes and it's going to keep the family you know in reality if you go back a hundred years the fact this is where the family unit was they stayed together they developed the homestead yep. the concept of modern day homesteading is like we'll buy a house and grow some stuff but really the homestead was a familial thing mm. that kept the family and it kept the hierarchical structure together this way when the parents got too old to take care of themselves, the rest of the family would yeah. step in. So we were trying to develop a fully integrated homestead family model. And so when he was putting in so much time and so much effort and so much consistency and kept doing it every day, every day, every day, yeah. we were brainstorming, like, what can we do to monetize the channel without being beholden yeah. to the system, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's when we set up the website about a year ago. Yeah, and, and we had absolutely, it was nuts. Our first month we made like 1400 bucks mm -hmm. and that's really the kickstart of this whole thing. And I mean, that was just selling teas, our homemade teas. And we were out in our little tiny house that we built and us boys were just tying tea bags as fast as we could. Sales were just going in, just coming in and out. And we were like, this is absolutely insane. Because I think a lot of people that start their YouTube channels and their homesteading and everything like that, they totally forget about the website and the actual, the marketing side of things too. Because, okay, even if you have three to 500 people that watch your channel, but they're loyal, right? Mm -hmm. Those are customers. You have to think of them as customers, not just as viewers. And when I started thinking of it from that perspective, that's really was the changing moment. And so now I don't have to just fully rely on YouTube revenue. If I get YouTube revenue, that's awesome, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really matter because I got the website, I got memberships, 
And then on top of that, all of that, then I have the homestead side of things where I trade and swap cattle and I got a sawmill. So I have all that side of things too. And then my brothers, my brother, James, he's really big into carpentry. So we build buildings and everything like that and just help out the community. Wow. So yeah, for listeners, Matt should be your mentor. If you're a teenager, <laughs> he's got multiple oh lines of revenue and ideas. That's, that's amazing. I want you to explain to listeners because okay. a lot of people think that YouTube channels are just for entertainment purposes. You mm. guys actually offer service and product via your brand, Texas Boys, which we're diving into now. Yeah. What do you guys offer? So let's see. I follow you on YouTube. I'm yeah. a fan. Your content's great. Your editing's great. And then I went to your website, which I'm assuming that's your conversion, right? Like you want them to hop over there. Yeah. What do you sell? We sell menagerie of things of lately, which has been, it's kind of funny how it all went off. We started selling our uh, our own local honey here from Texas, from a little bit from our supply and from now from this more from this local supplier. And because we just couldn't keep up, keep with, up the with the demand. So we had to start getting it from them. And mainly, I think the one thing is, is that a lot of homesteaders, they talk about the solutions and everything, but they're actually not doing it. Correct. So I think yeah. that's kind of the really cool thing about us is that we will post these videos of reacting to the problem. Mm -hmm. And then we will follow up with making videos about the solution and actually us doing the solution on top of that. I love that. Um, so back to what we sell. So we sell the local honey. We sell organic teas in bulk now. So, and cool. then we sell our own local roasted coffee. And then I'm trying to think, we have organic candles and candle wax melts. And then we have my mom's own apron line. And then my brother, James, he has his own canvas aprons for like working in and baking in. So and then we sell t-shirts. And then we sell uh, Made in America t-shirts too. Yeah. So for listeners, because most of them are audio, we said make 84 fiction again, right? Yeah. Make Orwell fiction again. Yeah. Make Orwell yeah. fiction again. Okay. Yeah. I, I yeah. love that. Love that. And then Matt, what's your- Go Green Compost to Globalist. It's been our best seller this year. Compost so, to Globalist. I know. So I walk around town wearing this thing with a cowboy hat on, all cowboyed up. And I mean, I turn so, so many people turn their head to look at that t-shirt and they all grin and laugh. So yeah. it's kind of funny. Yeah, well, we're driving some traffic there for you guys for sales with those for sure. And I'm going to pick one up myself. The, I was listening to, I think you launched a podcast, not a podcast, a YouTube video a few days ago. And you were talking about your background as a financial planner or in the financial yes, field, right? Yeah. So for listeners that may not know this about you, you spent 11 years in the financial sector. Yes. And you saw some things that were what I would consider maybe red flags. And yes. then you got out. Mm -hmm. And obviously now you're doing something different and more inspiring for, for yourself. So what did you see in your 11 years on the financial side that were red flags? Well, I, I think what I saw is the same thing we're seeing now with the videos we're putting out about the manipulation of our food infrastructure, all markets are at best manipulated. Financial markets at best are manipulated, at worst are completely and totally synthetic and artificial. And it's not even about printing money out of thin air, but now what they're doing is they are building derivatives from derivatives. So not only is it not there, they continue to compound these monetary vehicles that are based on less than nothing. They're, they're not even based on a concept or, or an idea. And there is no, nothing conceivable behind it that could even generate revenue. So that supposedly appreciates, there is, there is, it is, it's worse than smoke and mirrors. Mm -hmm. And what I originally saw was back in, it's been about, probably about 14 or 15 years now is I was, I were, I was watching these mutual fund companies. Mm. And so when you have a mutual fund and it's assigned to a certain asset class, right. And this would be, it's five-star fund. So whether it's whatever, you know, 
Black Rock Small Cap Fund or whatever it might be. And that would be their five star. That would be their thoroughbred. Well, when I would do a stock overlap, I would see that they would have different asset classes from the same fund f family. It was usually their one star dog fund and they would stuff it into that front runner fund and it would be more than five to 10% of the total portfolio value of that fund. And I'm like, well, that's not even in the asset, asset class and it's sucking wind, it's terrible. And why are they stuffing it in there? And the basic general logical conclusion is they're just doing it to manipulate and, and, and the entire financial market and system is a complete and utter manipulation, you know, mm -hmm. and that's how they're setting up this central bank digital currency because they're going to eventually pull the plug and all the blocks are going to drop. Yeah. You know, you and I agree on, on, on that. I don't play the stock market for that reason. <laughs> Sure. I, I feel like your rates of return and the different bubbles and it, it's a, it's a somewhat of a control mechanism, yeah. right? And if you look at like the retirement age, you know, it used to be like people would strive at like 62 to retire. Now it's like 67 if yeah. ever, right? Yeah. And then when you turn 60 and your retirement drops 22%, like it has since yeah. January of this year, you've got to work four more years. Yeah. And I just, for people listening, like, I'm not going to say, you know, I'm not a financial you know, advisor, so don't listen to me, but like do what you want. But there are many other places to put money mm -hmm. and time an effort. Yep. And I'm going to want to get into this in a second. But yeah, it was very interesting to hear that because I've heard that from a lot of other people too, pretty much just what you said. And so you mentioned food 401k in, yes, in dirt coin. Yeah. Let's talk about both of those. Okay. So, you know, we, we moved, we moved here to Texas eight years ago and I knew that I did not want to go back to the market. And Actually, our move was very radical in the sense that at the time I had a, I had a very successful construction company for me, it was very successful. Yeah. We were doing very well. It was providing for our needs. My wife, she's a stay at home mom. She trains the kids and she does makes us awesome food and she does all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and so it was providing for all of our needs and everything. Mm -hmm. And to move basically meant to kind of abandon all that, which is what we did. And so when we relocated, I didn't exactly, I went from making a very large six figure income, like a very large six figure income to, I had had my best year, the year right before we moved and did very well. And to making my first year down here, I made about $30,000. <laughs> so I made less than 10% of what I was making prior. Yeah, and we moved down here with like a couple five gallon buckets full of rice and beans, two mattresses and our clothes. And that was pretty much it. And then we started up and we got a rental and then you got the job. And it was, we didn't move down here with any, with no plan really. Yeah, we had no it intention was, of like, we're gonna move to Texas and homestead no. and we're gonna raise We don't have any food. family down here. We're still the only family down here. Yeah. So so, so after, after we got on our feet and started getting established, I'm like, okay, I want to invest. I want a dollar cost average. Mm -hmm. And this is something I wanna systematically do. I have no confidence in the market. I don't have enough money right now to buy real estate. So what can we do? Mm. And I was like, well, what we can do is I can start growing food. Mm. You know, if, if we can grow our own food and we can grow perennials, it's inflationary proof, exactly. you know, it's an inflation hedge. So I came up with this idea of, I'm going to take 10% of what I make and that, and I'm going to buy food infrastructure with it. So we bought an enormous amount of fruit. We, I kept procrastinating. I said, I want to do this. I want to do this. It was so, so funny. So then oh my word. one day, like a year went by. And one day I was like, we're going. We're going to do it. We're going to Bob Wells Nursery, which we're going to be at next weekend, by the way. Yep. But we're going to Bob Wells Nursery and I'm just buying a bunch of trees. So we went there <laughs> and I bought like $1,000 worth of trees. And this is when trees were reasonably priced. And like, we didn't know anything of anything. And- so we we 
did he give us some type of crazy bulk discount on the trees or no? Yes. Yeah. Well, that not that first time, but we, we got a really good deal. Yeah. So we brought him home and how many trees was it? Like a hundred trees or more? No, it was, it was, it was about 80 trees, 80 probably. trees. Yeah. Okay. And so we, we were, we were really big into the permaculture or at least we wanted to do the permaculture way of things. So we dug out our swales in a hillbilly fashion. We took a tiller and we tilled where we wanted our swell, swales to be. And then we dug out all the loose dirt and then we got some mulch and mulched over the swales and everything like that. And then we planted our first little food forest up in the front area. And now looking back, we had to pretty much dig up a lot of those trees and actually raise them up out of the ground a little bit because we like buried them way too deep. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was the thing. We came home with all these trees <laughs> and I never thought like, well, I got a plan. Yeah, this exactly. Stuff, you know? <laughs> and so then instead of just, you know, that's, that's just kind of the way I do things. But so we, we planted all these trees and I said, okay, that's what, every week. That's what I'm going to do. We'll buy some trees, start putting them in the ground. And that was how the food 401k was birthed. Yeah. So now we have one, two, three, four food forests now. So we got, we got one on the North end, one on the South and one on the East and one on the West side. So we well, have about 400 trees. Yep. We have everything from, everything. I have a fig collection. We have about 140 variety of figs. Yeah. We have all different kinds of apples, pears, peaches. persimmons, peaches, mm -hmm. uh, loquats, everything. pomegranates, um, pawpaws. pawpaws. So, you know, and obviously the stuff takes time to grow yeah. and fruit and mature, but that that's what started the food 401k. That once, once that started to mature, we launched the food forest in a box. Yeah. So we, we, we do that every winter yeah. once things start to harden off, which down was here. pretty crazy because we were selling cuttings on the website that last spring and it was doing okay. It was fine. You know, order here, order there of little packs of cuttings. And one day it came to me, I'm like, why not just put this all in a box mm -hmm. and then just call it food forest in the box. So I did that. And instantly within the first hour I was selling loads of these food forests in the box and it was, I was like, I don't even have the boxes, like enough boxes to keep up with this. So it was amazing, you know, a little bit of trial by fire there. But uh, so anyway, we sold $5,000 worth of food forests in the box in, a, in two weeks or so. Wow. So it was, we were, it was kind of scary there at the end because we were, we kept on cutting off of our fruit trees and everything. And we're like, running out we were running out <laughs> very quickly and we were like i don't even know how we're gonna even do this and then on top of that the last week i was thinking i was like why not reach out to other youtubers this is what product people that have products normally do they reach out to other youtubers and then have them promote their own product yep so i was like oh there you go so i went ahead i went ahead and did that and this one lady she had quite a few followers and I'm actually thankful that her video was a little bit late. It was a day late. And I mean, hundreds of people flocked in. They're like, where's the food for us in the box? I want to buy it. I'm like, oh my word. I'm so glad that because we ran out, we were totally yeah. out of cuttings. Wow. So it was, it was nuts. And I mean, all of us kids, we work in our kitchen for now. We're working on our little shop right now and getting it all ready for our YouTube. It'll have our YouTube studio in there for our sit down talks and everything, but it'll have a big, big workbench so we can pack orders and everything. Yeah. So, but it's just pretty nuts how things, things work like that. But, well, yeah. this is really, really, really a cool topic that we're on right now. Yeah. You know, you're talking about, and this is advice for everyone really is setting 10% of your income into an inflationary hedge mm, yeah. called food 401k. And so yeah, yeah. to summarize that for people, you guys bought a lot of fruit trees that yeah, yeah. grow fruit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you sold fruit as, you know, a, a cool name, food forest in a box. Yeah. Uh, and you're making money off that. Yeah. It's like, it's so weird to think because we're out there snipping the branches for these cuttings and you're practically printing money. Yep. You're selling little twigs and branches that will someday become their own fruit tree, mm -hmm. but you're snipping them off and it's like $5, $5, $5, $5. $5. And it's just, they can't tax you on that. Like it's absolutely amazing. So 
it's just pretty cool. Yeah. Well, they tax you once we make a sale. <laughs> sure, but, sure, sure, sure. You know, I got, I got, what, you're you yet. I got yeah. what you're saying. I got what you're saying. Matt's now. getting, Matt's getting to learn Sadly. about the system. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, let's not disregard the fact, you know, for people listening, because I think when people like us have these conversations, that people can sometimes think that what we're talking about is easy, right? Like no. it's not yeah. easy. Like yeah. what's easy is to put all your money in the stock market, forget yeah. about oh, it yeah. and then pray. Oh yeah. I mean, um, you nailed it. That That's, you know, the allure, mm. the allure of the market is I don't have to work. I don't exactly. have to study. I don't have to research. I'll hire a professional, mm. you know? Mm. And, and then they're like, you know, and, and the true reality, the true reality of that, even if the market wasn't fictitious, is 98% of the people in the market do not have the risk tolerance for it, for mm. it regardless. Yep. And I mean, I saw that cyclically over and over again. Oh, put me in. My neighbor just made 80%. Put me yeah. in. And then it tanks. And then they're like, well, pull me out. I can't, <laughs> you know, and, they, and they, they go in at the wrong time. They get out at the wrong time. Yep. And 98% percent of all investments fail that's a mm. statistical fact all the way across the board and that's even even dealing in an artificial synthetic yeah soap bubble of yeah. what they call financial investing today yeah and when we invest when we do invest since we did invest in the food forest food 401k there is a lot of up up front work but the long term, long term wise, the other thing that we did for our food forest, so then we didn't have to really work, we didn't have to like weed whack and mow and do all and weed and stuff like that, just to like keep it nice is actually we built a chicken pen, or just a big old run around the food forest. And it's pretty huge. It's like 120 by 120 by 120 box. And we just threw all of our chickens and all of our ducks in there for like the winter months, the winter months. And we did that for two of our food forests and it's working great. And we can rotate them back and forth so we can have them go in there. They'll eat everything down to the ground and fertilize. And then we can move them out when the fruit starts to set because they will jump up into the eat trees. <laughs> the, the chickens will, the ducks won't. But that's been the best system for us for maintaining it yeah. and work wise so there is some upfront work of course planting the planting the trees and stuff like that and then you know when it comes to fall time like right around now we'll start well in about a month we'll start to prune them back but that's the thing that's the really cool thing is that all of we, we already have to prune all these trees back right to keep them low so then we they're manageable well all those prune all those cuttings right that were taken off of there we would normally have to either just go throw them in a big old burn pile and burn them or maybe harvest them for like some smoking woods and stuff like that. But we can take those cuttings and then just resell them to people, mm -hmm. which is absolutely amazing for their food for us. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just really neat. Yeah. And what you're talking about is what I want more people to strive to is that our goal in life isn't to make everything easier. Yeah. <laughs> so Joel Salatin, who I'm a good friend with, just launched a podcast yesterday about that, how we have sacrificed in exchange for the easy life, mm. we have sacrificed our freedom. Yep, that's mm. right. That's very true. And that needs to be reversed. We should yep. be working harder oh, yeah. for, for ourselves in whatever yeah. skill sets we have, right? We all yeah. have different skill sets but not be looking for the easier life. I know, I don't know if you guys follow Mr. Money Mustache. He's a financial blogger from oh, Colorado. No. Phenomenal no. dude. His name's Pete Adney. He's a really great guy. And so he did a YouTube talk years ago where he said at some point after you have the 10 Mercedes, you have the huge mansion, you have the butlers, you have everything. Your next goal will be laying in bed, hooked up to a catheter to where you don't even need to get up and do anything anymore because yeah, yeah, you've made right. your life so easy yeah. through money and you have you have avoided difficulty to the extent yeah. that now you're just hooked up to a machine like in the movie Wally, -E, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, hearing that is really, really cool. And it's what I would consider an alternative investment and more people should be doing it. Yeah. I want your advice for people listening that are looking to build net worth and long-term wealth with, you know, good asset classes, what you would recommend, obviously food 401k, I think that's phenomenal. We don't need to get into specifics with anything in terms of like stocks, bonds, stuff like that. Sure. But like, like. In when it comes down to financials in today's world, there's one number that really matters, right? It's your net worth, yeah. <laughs> it's your total yeah. of assets minus liabilities. Yeah. What advice do you have for, for people, especially young people? Well, they, you know, my biggest recommendation is to bootstrap. You know, we live in a debt-based economy. And even it's it's very interesting. If even if you listen to Robert Kiyosaki, I've yeah. read all of his books. And originally, when you're originally start out with rich dad, poor dad, and quadrant, I forget there was there was the financial arc, and then there was the investor quadrant or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he, and it, it turned me off a little bit because he would say, you know, we're a debt based, we're a debt based economy, so you leverage debt, other people's money. But now he is saying the exact opposite of that, <laughs> you know, which is which is kind of where I stand is if you're going to develop business or assets you need to do it bootstrap you need to do it from your cash flow because to to leverage and to go into debt is incredibly dangerous so i would definitely recommend one start saving you know so that way you have some type of nest egg two nothing beats real estate as an mm. investment product so that that's the dirt coin i mean and whether that's dirt coin to plant fruit trees in whether that's the dirt to build a rental property on, yeah. whether that's the dirt to just go out and admire it. I mean, if you if you look at the dirt that we've recently bought, we we've done very well in real estate. We've done very well just buying raw dirt. And, oh, yeah. and right now it's exploded because of all this venture capital push where they're pushing all these dollars into buying up farmland yep. and, and buying up real estate. It's just made it go to the moon. And that will come back down. I oh, mean, yeah. that, that, that will crash and take advantage of that. Oh yeah. And then, you know, we do invest in gold and silver. And I know that's kind of like a lot of people talk about that, but it is a real asset. It's a commercial asset. It's a consumable, especially in the technology sector. It does hold its value. It, its value is manipulated. Yeah. And when they, when the pressure continues to get put on that, where they can't manipulate it as much you will really see it come up quite a bit. But that's basically where I recommend people to stay out of debt, Yeah, save your money. So if you want to start some type of business or company or buy something, guess what? You're going to have to work hard. Oh, yeah. You're going to have to deny yourself, right? So you're going to have to work hard. You're going to have to not buy all the trinkets and the trash and the little disposable stuff that you want right now. You're going to have to defer your gratification. You're going to have to save your money. You're going to have to invest your money in whatever investment vehicle, whether it's a business, whether it's a piece of dirt, whether it's a rental property, you have to invest your dollars there, wait for your return on investment, and then take your profits and buy your trinkets and the, your wants and your different things. But it's all about delayed gratification. Yeah. It's all about being disciplined, right? We know just like with training, you got to be disciplined, you know, it's like, Oh, I want a six pack, but I want to eat M&Ms every day. You know, well, that they don't go together. That yeah. doesn't work. You know, there's some self-denial in there. You have to eat properly. You have to train properly. You're going to be sore. It's going to suck, you know, embrace the suck and, uh, you know, defer. You're, you're, you're going to have to deny yourself and mm -hmm. have self-discipline to get to the goals that you're you want to get to yeah that was i asked joel salton a similar question and that is this, this very similar answer he said you have to live well below your means yeah exactly. in, investing and appreciating assets and then yep. live off the positive cash flow yep right? that's it they don't teach that in school that's for no, sure they don't know no. you know yeah that's yeah that's that's good stuff there let's get in let's switch topics here i know you guys launched a video on this i've been following this court case pretty good with amos miller yes uh, yeah the amish farmer i'm sure most of our listeners haven't even aren't even aware of what's going on so can you just give them a background of of uh, what happened with amos and where things are headed sure so 2014 2016 some allegations came against him. The government got involved. They made some 
spurious allegations that were never proved come to find out retrospectively the allegations that were charged against him a lady in florida passed away from cancer yeah and it was misdiagnosed by her doctors so to basically to evade and to avoid a lawsuit the doctor's legal counsel found out that she bought this raw milk and they basically blamed it on that she was poisoned by this raw milk that she bought in Pennsylvania. And so this has been this spin doctor backstory to this whole thing yep. so that the feds and the FBI and the F FDA and all these ne'er-do-well agencies can harass and harangue him, which would all be satisfied by very large penalty payments. Like if if he just pays the money, yeah, I know. You know, I know. it'll go away. Oh, yeah. It's at three hundred thousand, right? Yeah. It was at three hundred. And Justin, you know, it's funny. He 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 doesn't have even have the internet, but the the fundraising that came in exceeded that dramatically for yep. the sticking oh, yeah. up for him. So so he's get he got in trouble with the USDA, right? Yeah. Because he is a he's not a federally inspected facility, but he has like what four thousand customers, I think. Yep. Yep. Yes. Uh, loyal long term customers. He doesn't rely on diesel. He is yep. totally self sufficient and not yep. locked into the the system essentially. Yeah. Exactly. And so they target this guy to try to bring him down and put him out of business. This is sort of starting to backfire a little bit. Oh, I, I hope so. On that. Yeah, I, hope so. I certainly hope so. Now, did they had a court ruling on this yet? Because I heard that things may be going positively for him. Yeah, so what, what recently happened is a very kind of social media famous attorney picked up the case, Robert yep. Barnes. So he's going to be representing him. So he'll at, least get, he'll at least get competent representation in court. The other thing that they're trying to do after the fact is they're trying to put his wife's name on mm. the suit after the fact. Because they, they want to, they want to financially destroy him. Yeah, they, I know. They've, they've mm -hmm. made that obvious. So hopefully, so that I mean, one of the intentions and goals of our channel is, hey, if people are going to watch, let's put information out exactly. to educate people and enlighten them, so that they'll make better decisions, better choices. We get some, we get some flack for doom and gloom, and everything's terrible. But in reality, like you were saying about YouTube, there's a little bit of a panacea, like. There's a lot of people, especially in our genre, if you want to say we're a homestead genre, they create this illu illusion of, you know, this kind of Pinterest Instagram world yeah. where their chicken coop is perfect mm -hmm. and their birds are all groomed properly and all their animals are perfect and none of them yeah. ever have disease and no animals ever die. And, you know, reality is it's hard work. Yeah, it sucks. You know, if you want to eat high quality food, it takes an enormous amount of work. And so we we want to bring these things like Amos, Amos Miller. This is going to be a case study to take down everybody is what it's going to be. Well, this is why I'm following this so closely. And I know Joel is and a bunch of people because this is going to be case precedent, right? Oh, yep, exactly. So if they destroy this guy, if people yeah. think they're going to stop at him, they are no. nuts. No, that's exactly. But, right. but if he wins, um, yes. that's going to be huge. a huge too, right? Yes, that's going to be huge. Yeah. Yep. And that's why I want to keep pushing the information out there. Yep. There's been several channels that have been doing it, and it's getting an enormous amount of attention. And you know, our court system is a joke. Oh. So yeah. I think our only option is while we have the freedoms that we do have, is to just try this stuff in the court of public opinion and create mm -hmm. awareness. And I think that's that's obviously, and it's working. So. Well, I know Off Grid with Doug and Stacy and Tucker Carlson picked it up. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that's multiple millions of views. Oh, and that yeah. fired yes, a yep. lot of people up. And those are the routes we need to take because if we rely yep. on the conventional routes, he's just going to get chewed up, spit yep. out, and then they're going to move on to the next guy down the oh, line. Oh, yeah. Yep, that's right. And yeah. she's going to be me or you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to get into now, uh, I'm sure you guys have seen this. The USDA wants people to now register their gardens. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We did a video on that. <laughs> oh, my word. Yeah. So so explain to listeners what's going on with that. I'll, I'll tell you something else that's really interesting, too, about that topic. So we did a video on that topic. Now, I went through the website. 
right? I went through the USDA, the, uh, the it, it was the US, it's that, the hoop house. Yes, I, I was, it, the, it's the NRCS. Yes. 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 So I went through the NRCS. Yeah. I went through all the articles. I read everything, right? I read everything. And so we, so we do the video mm -hmm. on, they want you to, they want to have these community gardens and they want you to register your garden and it's going to be culturally diverse, you know, and it's going to have just the right, a number of the different color peoples of each skin color, each race, ethnicity, and all the different 48,000 genders or whatever. And, and they want you to register your garden so that, I don't know, they can give you federal funds. Like I, I never, I never got the gist of register your garden, but Here's what's interesting. We post that video. Yeah. And somebody's like, if you would have done five minutes of research, you would have saw that this isn't for private gardens. So I go back into the this article on there. Yeah. And I read through and it says, cannot register, uh, can't, can't register private property garden, something like that. And I'm like, that was not there before. Huh. I'm like, it did not say that previously but now that because doug doug did a yep. video on yes. this we did a video on this and several people have picked oh, this yeah. up allison Morrow just did a video on this am wake up those guys out there in cali that they, they're all I, I listen to a lot of all, all alternative media and everybody's doing a video on this they mm -hmm. literally went back in yep. and they changed, changed the wording and this is the postmodern world we live in exactly. where if everything's digital they can go back in there and change it and they'll be like Look at this idiot. He just told everybody they want us to register their garden. We don't want anybody to register their garden. Well, if you're, I, what, how are you <laughs> register? If it's not on private property, what are you doing? Like a you're, flower garden? you're gonna, I'm gonna go stake a claim in the middle of the road out there and be like, oh, I'm registering my community garden on public <laughs> yeah. property. Like that doesn't even make any sense. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, they definitely, I think what they were trying to do, well, all, the three of us know what the real intention yes, is, right? Yeah. But uh -huh. they, you know, the website eatwild.com, right? Like it's a resource for, for meats and, you know, all of that's, you know, been around for years. You find farmers and whatnot. I think that they were trying to create their own version of that. Yes. But then huh. they, people looked at it as such a, a joke yeah. that then they started to get into, well, it's just for community gardens and, right. uh, you know, this and that. And there's, there's sort of backstepping. And so, yeah, that's, uh, that, that definitely got my attention. So I want to get into this study that came out with the school lunches. Yeah, I did an Instagram post on this. This isn't a surprise to me. I actually co-owned a curriculum company, a health and PE curriculum company called Fit Kids Fit Future. And we were in 75 different schools. We wrote a very high oh, level wow. middle school and high school curriculum with like whole foods and reading labels oh, and man. all of this. So when this study came out, I wasn't remotely surprised at the crap these kids are eating. Yeah, yeah. So for people listening, it said 95% of the public school lunches contained glyphosate, aka yeah. Roundup. 100% of the school lunch sampled contained heavy metals at levels up to 6,293 times higher than the EPA maximum levels allowed in mm -hmm. drinking water. Yeah. And 20% of the samples contained veterinary drugs in them. Oh, whoa. Yummy. Okay. So this study came out and this was a neutral source study, right? Yeah. Uh, this data with public school lunches is mind blowing. Yeah. And so these kids are literally being poisoned. Literally. And so I guess, I don't know what I want to dive into with this, but like what in the world is it going to take to change to get real food into our school systems? It, it's well, it, I think it's an indictment of our school system. Yeah. I, I think the first question that has to be asked, and I know it's revolutionary, and I know like the way that our society is set up and kind of synthetic and whatever. Yeah. When you say that the government school system needs to be abolished, I think they just prove that fact every day. Mm. They are so unconcerned about what they teach and train and brainwash our children with that that takes precedence that the 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 information takes precedence over the fact of will the children even survive mm. the process like they're so addicted to their woke agenda that it doesn't even matter 
if the kids survive to graduate mm -hmm. because they're just totally at to, and, and here's the fascinating thing because and i and i know a lot of public school teachers it's like yeah but you know us public school teachers we don't make no money and that's totally true that is that that's true. totally true yeah. you know you're making 30 40 grand whatever and you're basically treated like a part-timer but yeah. the reality is the school system i mean where we came from the school was getting or generating a hundred to three hundred and thirty-eight thousand per student. So there's wow. this enormous amount of cash, right? But we got to buy them Wonder Bread and bologna. Yep. You know what I mean? No, that's called misappropriation of funds. That's called embezzlement. That's called organized crime. And the reality is, is you don't care if you poison the kid's body because you're already poisoning their mind, their brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I, we're probably in the minority with this, but I don't know anymore. I think that's by design. Yeah. Um, oh, I've yeah. done for years that if you can keep the public dumb, sick and poor, you can control them. That's oh, exactly yeah. it. Yeah. Right. That's it. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's, and you know, but I have a, I have so much empathy for these kids. You know, they have attention issues. They're a obese. Yeah. Yeah. They can't get up off the ground hardly, you know, yeah. there's, and then it just goes on and on and on, but no one's looking at the obvious. Yeah. Like you're literally eating shit. Yeah. Yeah. And you you want to put another label on a kid that has, you know, some issue. It's like, well, mm. he hasn't felt right because his digestion's been off. He has brain fog. His insulin levels are fluctuating constantly. Right. He's yeah. got every color dye running through his bloodstream. Yeah. 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 Uh, and <laughs> I, you know, it's just frustrating. We have a nine-year-old. He eats very clean. You know, obviously we're very structured, but you know, what, what he's around and sees is, is tough, you know? Yeah. Well, that, I mean, the, the hardest part for kids is peer pressure, you know? Sure. And the thing is, is if their friends are just eating trash and gun in Mountain Dew and Snickers bars and all that stuff, I mean, that's really hard for the other kids like oh well, all my friends are doing it you know yeah. what i mean so it, it's hard to maintain a clean diet if you know everybody well everybody else you know slurps mountain dew mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's a challenge yeah for sure i read on your website you guys have a strong faith right you're christians yes sir. yep yeah how does that play a role in your decisions day to day homeschooling the food you eat you know the content on your youtube channel what you stand for how does that play a role you know the bible says that if we worship god we have to worship him in spirit and in truth and so and i believe through all these different current events with you know whether you need to put something on your face or whether you need to get a injection or whatever there's truth and there's a lie you know, and when living according to scriptures, we recognize that God is a creator. He created us in his image. And so we want to recognize him in everything we say and everything we do. We want to recognize him in, you know, we want to do our best. So we want to obviously eat the best that we can, right? So that yeah. we have enough energy to perform. And we just want to kind of honor and glorify him. And he's a creator of everything. And there, there seems to be the desire to destroy everything that is natural mm. and i my personal belief and conviction is that because that's because they want to be gods yeah. and they hate god as creator and they want to replace him so they're, they're going to trash everything and then they're in the catbird seat and they can do whatever they want and it's really because they know that they're going to give an account to god so if they systematically destroy God, they think in their puny, feeble mind that they're not going to have to give an account to him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that's well said. They're doing everything they can to get rid, rid of yep. religion. You know, they've, yep. done it, they've done it in schools. They did it during COVID when they shut churches down, which I yep. didn't even think was possible. And yeah, you take God out of that picture. You've got a population running around with no morals, no ethics, yep. no one to answer to. Yeah, and for all. It's a free for all. Yeah. yeah and, and it's po it's postmodernism, you know. Bilderberg had a meeting in 18 or 2016 and one of their topics was 
living in a or ruling in a post-truth world, oh. you know? And what's post-truth? Post-truth is, oh, hey, they want you to register your garden. Oh, let me look at the article. No, it says you can't register your garden. They're not, can't. I'm like, yeah, that, it's because you can rewrite it in real time, right? <laughs> and yep. change the facts and change history. That's post-truth. That's post-modernism. Mm, absolutely. So if you were president today, what would be the first thing you would implement to turn this country around back on a positive course? I mean, it's, you know, I real it's, it's easy to make broad dynamic statements. Yeah. I mean, I, what I say on our channel all the time is government needs to be smaller. Mm -hmm. Now, whether you're a voluntary anarchist, right. Or you're an anarcho capitalist, which is I do recognize the fact that some government is needed. You know, the argument is, well, if if there's any government, it will be abused. And there's some truth to that, okay? And I'll recognize that. But in the grand scheme, and I know a lot of my anarcho-capitalist and anar anarchy and voluntarist friends would not like that, but, you know, that's, that's the way I see it. And it's more like a Rothbardian kind of liber libertarianism, but I would dramatically shrink i mean we could all we need to do is undo some of these things like some of the, all this like all these agencies like the no such agency and all of these spying agencies we could pretty much eliminate them all they're doing is being used for nefarious purposes they are not d performing a necessary function so like cia fbi and i mean good luck as a president trying to get that stuff yeah. resolved because the last guy I remember that mentioned it, you know, uh, he was here in Texas and it didn't end well for him. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the kind of stuff that, but I mean, if I was president, I would shr dramatically shrink government, give the power back to the States. Yeah. What was really weird with the whole COVID thing was they, they kind of did this reverse mind control thing where there's, well, it's up to the States, yep. you know, and they, and, and they would let these tyrannical governors and these uh, tyrannical mayors, and they would just go like, yeah, I get to play in the sandbox, you know? But in reality is you can't, and, and that's that shows you what a puppet show government is. Like, look, if you're going to give the power back to the states, do it for real, yeah, right? And, and, and reduce your, your footprint, reduce your infrastructure, keep your stupid money. We don't want your hooks and strings and bells and whistles because yeah. all of that federal funding is just we're going to drag you around by the nose yep you know so i mean if we reduced federal government by about 80 percent, i think for one we would all have a lot more freedom and two i think the world would be a much better place i know the rest of the world would it would the rest of the world would be a much better place because all of these countries we've been dropping democracy on mm -hmm. for the last 40 or 50 years and spreading democracy and killing and having 90 percent collateral damage it'd be like wow like the world's kind of like a nicer place now that america isn't trying to like kill everybody yeah 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 that's well said matt what advice do you have for you know maybe 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds that want to follow in your footsteps or something okay. similar. You know, you're a big inspiration. I just think, you know, there's a lot of, well, Jordan Peterson says this a lot all the time, but most people are dying for a word of encouragement. Mm. And, you know, looking at your story, where you're headed, you know, your mentor, you know, your dad, like, yeah. you know, you've got a pretty good setup. And again, yeah. we've emphasized it doesn't come easy, which is no. good because we don't want the easy life. But like, what would you tell a 14 or 15 year old listening to this, you know, maybe sitting on the sideline, low self-esteem and wants to get in the game? Well, I would, you know, you're going to have to work hard for it. You know, it's tricky because, you know, the Lord has deeply blessed me and everything that I have and where I am in my position in life right now, but to encourage some, a young man or a young lady out there that's listening, let's see, whatever you are passionate in doing, you definitely have to figure that out first. Hmm. Well, the one thing is, it sounds kind of very, it's very simple. It's just working hard 
and having a good attitude, having good attitude while doing it, not getting distracted and looking at your phone and seeing what's going on over there. And I can't tell you, I have so many jobs, offers all the time, all week long from just my community around me, just because I show up on time and normally 10, 20 minutes before they tell me to actually get there normally. And I'm always sitting there waiting for them and uh, work as hard as I can. Um, And if I ever borrow something from somebody, I always return it better than I found it. Just little simple things like that. You know, when somebody asks you to go and run and get something, you don't just walk there or whatever. You run and go and get it and you come right back and you give it to them. And when somebody tells you to do something, don't have... I don't like being micromanaged. So I am always on top of you tell me it once and you don't ever, you don't, you can come back at the end of the day and you're going to see it done. uh, Just like you said it. So just starting out with simple stuff like that, the word spreads around the grapevine around here anyway of us boys and our work ethic. And, you know, just making a name for yourself will help you so will get you so far in life. I think as young adults or young kids, you know, you're you're kind of pulled into this very synthetic way of life because, you know, especially if you're from the public schools and everything like that, it's very synthetic and you're kind of removed from your actual community. And if you could get back to your community and give back to your community, you can really succeed in life. And like my dad was saying about your financial aspect of things is definitely diversifying your income stream. Don't just work at McDonald's or Walmart. Okay. If you have to get a couple jobs here and there, do it. Absolutely do it. And you know, you're going to have to hustle at the start. You know, that is where you're going to have to put in your mo your, the biggest amount of work is right at the start, getting the ball rolling. But once the snowball is rolling, it will only go faster and faster and faster and faster and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, you know, towards the end of your life, you can kind of slow back a little bit anyway, and, uh, and actually enjoy your life. So like you said, delayed gratification, you know, even with us boys, we still, I, I kind of manage our income and everything like that. So I have my other brothers and they're like, we want this, that, and the other. I'm like, well, okay, we can do one of those things this month, but we can't do all 10 of them this month because, you know, I want to keep on investing in my businesses in smart ways, you know? So yeah, working hard making a good name for yourself. Those would probably be my advice to a young man out there. So there you go. (laughs) Yeah. Do do you, I'm curious, Matt, there's a lot of people that don't take action with a dream or passion of theirs because they're afraid of what other people think. Yeah. You, You put a lot of content out there. You're in front of hundreds of, well, millions actually of people. Is that something you think about what they think about you? No, I I have a personality that like, if somebody doesn't like what I'm doing, I'll just strive for it even more. Like, I'm so glad that they don't like what I'm doing. You know, that's just me personally. And I get that from my dad, you know, like, oh, you you think you, you know, you hate my guts. Good. I'm glad you hate my guts. So I don't know. That's just me. But, you know, as much as it sounds cheesy, uh, like the American dream and stuff like that, at least this has been my dream. And, you know, just from a little boy and being like, man, if people would just like watch my content and everything like that, what would that be like? You know, I could, I can still remember back only having 10 subscribers and just thinking, oh man, if I could only have a hundred people watch my thing, my thing, that would just, Mm -hmm. I would just be on top of the moon, you know? And now sitting here, you know, it's kind of funny how, how your wants and desires are, you know, and how they change and stuff. Now I'm sitting here with 80,000 subscribers and I have to definitely still humble myself because I'm like, look, stupid, you have 80,000 subscribers now. And my brain keeps, my brain is always on big picture, always big picture. And us three brothers work perfectly because I'm big picture guy. My, James, my brother, who's working on sheetrock while we're talking here. He, he's spackling. He's the spackling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's very detail minded. And then my other brother, when he's on the job site or whatever, just coming up, he's always coming up with crazy ideas 
on how to improve things. And I'm like, wow, I never would have ever thought that. He's very outside of the box. So me and James are here and he's way in left field, always thinking about something else. So he's always like 10 steps ahead of us. So we have a very good dynamic, but definitely just grabbing your dreams and desires and trusting in the Lord. A lot of people do forget about that. If the Lord's not in it, it ain't going to happen. It's just going to, it's going to go right downhill into a dumpster fire. You know, you do have those people that do succeed in life without the Lord, but you know, he controls everything. And if he's on your side, you're set. I mean, even if you don't make out that well in the world, I mean, you still, you're going to die and go to heaven. There you go. If you're safe. And you have a great, you have a great foundation with them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is the American dream dead in America? Well, I, I think what we need to do, especially since I think it's appropriate since we live in a postmodern, post truth world, is I believe the American dream, it depends, is the American dream the house with the white picket fence and yeah. a dog and a cat and 1.2 children? You know, I, I think, yeah, I think, uh, is the American dream dead? Mm. I believe it's dying. Yeah. I believe, and, you know, this is something me and my wife talk about all the time. I, I we grew we I grew up poor. I didn't know it. You know, I grew up with a a nuclear intact family. Mm-hmm. I grew up with a mom and dad that loved us and they loved God and they were very active in their faith and in raising us with a with a biblical foundation. And they weren't just Christians in name only. They were the real deal. But we were we were poor. You know, and I didn't know it until growing up and actually having money. And then looking back, mm-hmm. I'm like, wow, we were like, we were, we were kind of poor. You know, I wore all the bobos and the hand-me-down clothes and the secondhand thrift store stuff. You know, a lot, a lot has changed, you know, a lot has changed. And how do you, this is the conversation I have with my wife is like, how do you grow up wealthy? I mean, compared to my parents, I mean, we are we are in pure opulence. Mm -hmm. I mean, by a factor of 150 or 200. Mm -hmm. So that's part of saying is the American dream dead. I mean, we're Rockefeller status compared to what my parents were. Mm -hmm. So there's, okay, I'll put it this way. There's still absolutely for right now, there's opportunity. Okay. And you can, you can either ignore the opportunity or seize the opportunity. And my definition of the American dream is the opportunity. So the opportunity is still there. So I would say that the American dream is alive and well. I agree. I guess it it depends on how you look at it. There's opportunity everywhere, every day. Everywhere. I think it's a question that I actually think about quite a bit, because I think many people are lacking that chief aim in their life that vision, that direction, that striving for more, that building, growing. Yeah. And when you don't have that, and I'm defining that as the American dream, and obviously yeah. that's different for everyone, right? Sure. Um, yeah. But when you don't have that, mm. you're wandering. Yeah. yeah. And when you wander, you get depressed. You yeah. Have yeah. Bad habits. Yeah. Very true. You know, you get up late in the morning, you yeah. don't work out because it, yeah. it doesn't really matter. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's a question I, yeah, it's a question I ask people, you know, because it used to be about, you know, get, you know, building that house and raising that family and, yeah. you know, tending to some animals and, or whatever, building the yeah. business or going to a job you truly believe and I, in. I think that's what it is. You know, we yeah. were created by God to work. Yeah. You know, Correct. and our work, you know, as, as this technology invades our life and we, tr- we trade freedom for convenience, mm. right? That That's where it goes. You know, for <sighs> convenience, oh, I'm going to veg out and watch the Black Mirror. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not going to, I could be taking advantage of opportunities all around me. You know, whether, whether I could be harvesting, whether I could be planting, whether I could be yeah. shepherding, whether I could be tending, what I, what, whether I could be doing all these things. I was created we were created, I think, part of the industrialization of society and the extraction from an agrarian culture is we were we were created to do that. Oh, yeah. And what was very profound to me 
is where I had never done that. I was never trained in that. My parents never did any kind of horticulture or husbandry or anything. And I start doing that. It was so profound. I'm like, wait a minute. And like when we got the honeybees, you know? Yeah. And you're doing that and you're like, people don't get this, but like this, you're supposed to be doing this. Like, yeah. and as you're doing it, you're like, this is meaningful. Not only is this meaningful, like I'm supposed to be doing this. Yeah. And when you don't have that in your life, mm. That's definitely a void. I mean, yeah, that's a, that's the black hole. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know? And I have empathy for people with that. I know that you know live in that world. Jordan Peterson offers a, a course called you know his self authoring program, and it is it does exactly what we're talking about, where they lay out that dream and that vision. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so for people listening, maybe that'd be a good place for for you to start if you, that falls into you know who you are. And Matt, I'm curious, what's your 10 year vision with your company, Texas Boys? Wow, I haven't been asked that question for probably a couple of years. Oh, 10 year vision. Let's see. Well, I would like to in about a year. Well, for our business, not for my life. Okay, let's see. For our business. I would really, oh, in 10 years, I would love for, well, you'll definitely should be home by in 10 years. I would love for my dad to be home. All six of us kids will be working on this business. Right now, there's just three of three of us kids, but the other three are little. So hopefully they'll all be working on this business. The goal will be that we won't have to go out and get normal worker bee jobs cog in the machine type of jobs, expand the YouTube channel as much as possible, but mainly to whatever platform. Yeah. Allow us to <laughs> <die freely>. Yeah, <laughs> mainly just be doing that diversifying where our content is going. Maybe definitely, I would really like to get our own podcast going too. Sure. Yeah. That'd be we awesome. We talked about that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, definitely getting our membership up with people. So then we could just eventually maybe drop YouTube or if they do kick us off, it doesn't really hurt us at all. Mm. What else? Oh, one dream would be awesome would to be maybe kind of have our own nursery type thing. We do have, we're going to be putting up a greenhouse tomorrow, mm. a 20 by 40 greenhouse. But if we could expand on that and I've really thought, we've thought about this several times is actually going into the permaculture business where we landscape for people and make a edible landscape. an edible landscape. Mm -hmm. I've absolutely loved that idea. And just taking somebody's backyard or front yard or side yard or whatever, and just making it just abundant in, you know, fruit trees and berry bushes and everything like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I tell you, one of the challenges you're going to have, and this is a good challenge, and Joel Salton's done this beautifully, is scaling your enterprises. Yes. So yeah. You have a lot of ideas, a lot of great tangible things, especially as your brand grows. But, you know, thinking about how you can duplicate yourself with apprentices, interns, yep. and whatnot. I know Joel has about 25 apprentices at one time. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. down there and what they learn is life-changing yeah. and that he's getting obviously help to you know run the polyface enterprise but that's something you know you might want to write down you know yeah yeah it's great well guys today this was awesome we went a little long but i had a lot of good questions i wanted yeah. to get into and matt thank you i want listeners to find you and your website so how can they do that well we are on youtube by the texas boys and our our website is thetexasboys.com and you can find all of our content over there. You can even become a member for five bucks a month and you get all of our videos ad free and you get all of our family's recipes and exclusive discounts to the products that we sell. Also, we are on Odyssey and Rumble and maybe soon to be on Rockfin as well, but that's where you can find us. Awesome, guys, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, yep. Josh. Thanks for Thank having you. us. We, it was awesome. Yep. Yep. You're welcome.